1970 Chrysler Imperial. It's a one-armed bandit, but the only jackpots are hairier balls. Bob Evans. Bob Evans. Bob Evans. Bob Evans. 1970 Chrysler Imperial. Now with less asbestos. Ever try to jack off your bestie while you're both in bed? Harder than you porn makes it look. It's no more sensual than one, two, three, four, I declare a thumb war. If, if you do it with more power, does it? You get the one wheel peel. Uh, oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so sorry. It's I like literally did it like a 70s movie. It did. <laughs> I'll get it. I'll I'm get sorry, it. man. All right. Don't even worry. Really, that really happens. That was hilarious. Maybe you hit the banana. Hmm? Maybe you hit the banana. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Doyle rolls. <laughs> All right, which one was it? It's up here. <laughs> Put that back on there. Imperial. A car for a medallion-wearing, mouth-breathing, Reuben-eating, sweet-tea-slurping business owner named Rich the Montpelier Dollar Franklin. Every question he asks you begins with, I got a proposition for you. Hello, Mopar 440. We meet again. You 93-octane, drinking, lead-substitute-needing, oily, bragging, 7.2-liter V8. Yes, in muscle cars, you were as satisfying as Led Zeppelin's rock and roll. But in a car with a curb weight of 4,960 pounds, and with some spare fluids and a tool kit in the trunk, this Imperial weighs 5,000 pounds, or two and a half Imperial tons, and coupled to a 722 Torque Flight 3 speed, sending power to a Mall Walker 2.94 rear end ratio with Sure Grip, which is really just Mopar's name for limited slip. This Imperial groans up to 60 miles an hour in. Uh... Well, 8.9 to 9.4 seconds. That's not bad when you think about it. Chrysler advertised 350 horsepower for the Imperial. And since 1970 is pre-smog and pre-catalytic converters, this car runs like the Blues Brothers. The top speed is 124 miles an hour, or thereabouts, and the quarter mile could be had in 16.6 .6 seconds, according to Chrysler. Average fuel economy was 9.2 miles per gallon, but David averaged 13 on his drive home up 81 to Scranton Wilkes-Barre after this film shoot, which makes this more economical than that Buick LeSabre with the Dynaflow transmission. MSRP for Imperial four-door hardtops in 1970 was $8,503, which translates to $56,268 in 2019. So adjusted for inflation, this car is the same price as a GMC Yukon or up-trimmed Toyota 4Runner. And for this mid-level domestic luxury vehicle price, you get a torsion bar front suspension with leaf springs in the rear, a vinyl-covered roof, a seeking radio, Yes, it will find a radio station for you. It was such a Ted DiBiase money feature, Mopar gave the Radio Seek button a special location on the floor next to the high beam button. It has pillarless doors with no B pillar. Well, not where you'd expect to find it. I mean, the rear pillar, you know, back by the rear glass is the B pillar. In the middle, there's nothing. You also get climate control in 1970. It's crude, but it works. Hit the auto button and this crazy analog box behind the dash will do its best to maintain temperature in this bounce house of an interior. To move enough air, the Imperial has two blower motors, one in the front and one in the rear. Mmm, the ride. True luxury is rocking you to sleep. The torsion bar suspension doesn't absorb bumps like an air ride does. Instead, 
It spreads those bumps out over the entire Commonwealth. Hit a bump in Jonestown, and the shock will stretch all the way to Easton, like the van hitting the water in Inception. (laughs) But there's another bit of luxury going on here that you can't find in modern luxury domestic cars. I call it clean fingernails. Look at your fingernails right now. Yeah, look at that. Look at them. Probably like mine. Just all cut weird and in haste. I mean, who uses a file? It's like, cut them down. That's, that's it. But back in the 50s and, and, and 60s, clean fingernails on men were a thing. It, it, it was something a gentleman did. But it wasn't some chival- uh, chivalric display. It meant more than that. Back in the day, I'm again talking 50s, 60s, if a man had clean fingernails that, that were clean underneath and, and were, uh, you know, filed down nice in a nice curve, uh, that, that was him telling you something. I've, I've arrived. I'm now the boss. I've, I've, I've been promoted to a point where I don't have to get dirty anymore. Hmm. I mean, what's the point of just filing down and really making your fingernails, you know, look beautiful if you're just going to go out and work and get them dirty and all chipped again. Nowadays, we kind of uh, admire that. You, you see a rich guy, but, it, but his fingernails are all dirty. That, that's now a point of pride. The opposite happened. Yeah, sure, I'm, I'm well taken care of, but I still work. And that's reflected in our luxury vehicles. We, norm no, we don't have big sedans anymore. We have big SUVs. Because a Cadillac Escalade is still a truck. It's still a utility vehicle. Heck, they even turned the Chevy Avalanche into a Cadillac. Or up-trimmed King Ranches. Those things are easily $60,000 for a truck. And they're really, really comfortable. But they're still a trade vehicle at heart. Driving a big sedan in the 50s, 60s, and in this case, the 70s, was you expressing to the world, I'm done working. I no longer have to work. I don't have to pick up the freight. I don't have to pick up the goods. Therefore, I no longer need a utility vehicle. I will have a sedan, because the only thing I have to do is carry my family around and maybe some luggage. There will be other people to carry the big boxes now. And if you don't believe me about the whole cleaning the fingernails thing, go look at the old movie trope that started in the 80s of the bad guy filing his fingernails. Yeah, all those 80s movies, even 80s cartoons. You want to show a bad guy? Have him have a show like Kingpin? Show him filing his fingernails. Nowadays, we look at it and go, oh, what, the, what is he doing that for? That's what that was about. And there's some of that signaling still going on today. But the appreciation for these big sedans are coming back. And I believe also the appreciation for male grooming. I mean, look at everybody selling beard oil these days. 1970 Chrysler Imperial. For the well-kept man who still gets action. Even though he's bent dick Billy. Every time his dick gets hard, it looks to the east. 1970 Imperial. The original owner was so far ahead of the curve, he made a flashlight out of a dish rag and a measuring cup. History time. The story of the Chrysler Imperial dates all the way back to 1926, the year Route 66 opened, the year Kelly Blue Book was first published, the year Pontiac was born. It was also the year Walter P. Chrysler decided to go balls deep in the luxury car market with a car offered in Roadster, Coupe, Sedan, Phaeton, yeah, they were using that word, and seven-passenger limousine styles. Those first-generation Chrysler Imperials were handsome devils. The color of freshly varnished shoes, with license plates resting horizontally across the grill like lampshade mustaches. The Imperial was a top-of-the-line model for Chrysler, and represented the apex of what the company could be, if they could have their luxury cake and eat it too, while also providing a more affordable, entry-level car. And in a way, it kind of worked for the Imperial, because it was less about the opulent peacocking and more about affordable luxury. Chrysler Imperial. The hell my car is in luxury. You can suck a fart right out of my balloon knot, pal. By 1955, Chrysler decided to make the Imperial its own marquee, its own name. They were trying to say that this isn't a Chrysler, it's an Imperial. 
They were trying to have their own luxury brand like Ford had Lincoln or GM had Cadillac. It was also a way of separating the luxury identity from the standard Chrysler fleet. But the problem was the lack of individual showrooms for the Imperial at Chrysler dealerships nationwide. You see at Ford and GM dealerships, Cadillacs and Lincolns were actually treated as their own separate marquees. They were displayed accordingly. Meanwhile, the Imperial fleet just sort of blended in with the rest of the Chrysler cars at dealerships, to where there was no meaningful distinction between the luxury and standard models, even if the dealer signs did indicate Imperial as its own separate marquee. Still, Chrysler did such a bad job of marketing the Imperial as its own marquee that even now a lot of the cars from the fourth generation are referred to as Chrysler Imperials. Even I just referred to it as this even though there was no real Chrysler badging anywhere to be found until the name was re-added at the start of the 1970s. Rivals didn't list their cars as Ford Lincolns or GM Cadillacs, yet Chrysler had somehow found its luxury and low-cost identities intertwined like tree roots. So Chrysler tried course-correcting by offering a touch of luxury to another one of their brands. Plymouth. In a New York Times article titled Behind Chrysler's Long Decline, Its Management and Competition, dated August 17, 1979, it stated that one of the issues Chrysler faced was the release of the Plymouth Valiant in the late 1950s. The executives in charge of marketing insisted that 75% of the cars should be built at the lowest possible price, and only 25% of the budget should be used to build Valiants with all the expensive bells and whistles. The idea being that the luxury market had shrunk by the late 1950s and the higher price trim levels wouldn't sell well. Well, that wasn't true. Cadillac can tell you that. And immediately, dealers reported customers demanding the more expensive trim. At this point, it's not hard to imagine that supply couldn't meet the demand, especially if there was a sudden market for top trim Plymouth Valiants. What Chrysler was doing was trying to cut back on expenses. But what happened is they ended up with a giant missed opportunity. So they stayed in the luxury car market and kept the Imperial brand alive through the 60s and into the early 70s. This was pre-oil crisis, of course and people still wanted full-size cars that looked like aftershave bottles. But when the fuel crisis hit, and the demand for smaller cars grew like an unwanted erection at a candlelight vigil, Chrysler suddenly found themselves with lots of unsold inventory, and the company was staring death straight in the face until that government bailout. And Roman can tell you all about this in his story called The Legend of Lee Iacocca, if you want to check that out. We'll put a link in the description and maybe one in the annotations at the end of this video. But the long and short of it is that you could argue that the 1970 Imperial was the last gasp of the Imperial as a traditional luxury land yacht. The Imperial had lost its assembly plant in 1962, its platform in 67, and its body shell in 69, so that it now had to share components with entry-level Chrysler models, like the Newport. The Imperial had some good press as the basis of Black Beauty, the car from the Green Hornet TV show in 1966, but it still wasn't as iconic as the George Barris Batmobile from the same year. So the Imperial brand was shelved in 1975 until its brief resurrection from 1981 until 1983. Now with all of that having been said, the Imperial still has the distinction of a classic car when set against the modern backdrop of ridiculous, aggressive styling cues that have no real reason to exist, beyond quietly reassuring sales managers with five-figure alimony payments that masculinity isn't really under attack. But even while it looks amazing against the contemporary backdrop, how much did this really stand out in the age of Chevy Novas, Firebirds, Darts, and even Chrysler's own 300, and that's just 1970 alone? But it's still a classy car nearly 50 years on. And yeah, some might say classiness doesn't exist anymore, in the same way that clean fingernails don't exist anymore. But that's a lie being fed to keep the commercialism of Valentine's Day viable in an era of non-committal, casual dating, of skipped dinners and no follow-up phone calls. But classiness exists, believe you me. It exists in the beating heart of a luxury car from the 70s. A land barge that has no business being anything more than a novelty from an era before Chrysler really started to take a nosedive. But whether we mean to or not, oftentimes we don't judge classic cars against the standard of their own eras. We judge them against the standard of ours. Because look at cars now. They're of, as visually unspectacular as a binder full of carpet swatches. It's an old man complaint. Of course it is. 
But to modern eyes, current cars lack any sort of character other than cute or angry. They have soft, non-threatening curves for karate practice. They look hastily finished, like homework on Sunday night. You seen one, you seen them all, like DeviantArt accounts. So when you spend all day looking at bland, forgettable Acuras filling up at rudders, seeing this Chrysler Imperial is like discovering a shoebox full of old love letters, and driving one is like sending them all 20 years later. So let's make our devil's music in the back of this rolling porno theater. Let's dash ourselves upon the rocks of passion in a classic car that smells of forgotten Mondays. Let our bodies make the lustful symphony of a tube sock filled with applause as it's beaten against a pinewood coffee table in an elk's lodge. The world belongs to us, Linda. For as long as an unfiltered cigarette and pitch black coffee is part of this complete breakfast. The Imperial is the emperor of this shriveling world. So long as the beating heart of this steel chariot roars to life, and as long as there's breath in these calcium-rich, fart-filled meat bags we call our bodies, the Chrysler Imperial will be our fist fight against time itself. Bob Evans. Bob Evans. I'm just going to use this as Monday songs. I don't feel like recording anything. I don't think the mics. I, I, I don't think they're working. They're working.